In this, the seventh lesson, we continue with the nervous system. Now we're looking at the ear's role in balance, as well as certain disorders linked to the ear. From our previous lesson, we discussed the structures and functions of the different parts of the ear. We have found that the outer ear is filled with air, the middle ear is filled with air, and the inner ear is filled with liquid and it's made up of bones. We also know that the receptors for both hearing and balance are found within the inner ear. If we zoom into the structure of the inner ear, we find that the cochlea, we know inside of it, it's got the organ of corti, which is the receptor for hearing, but we're not interested in that for now. We're interested in balance and the structures responsible is one, the semicircular canals. There are three of them which are in different positions so they can pick up movement in different directions. So they'll pick up basically the direction, whether you're moving front, back, right, left, etc. At the base of these semicircular canals, there are swellings known as ampulla. And within those ampulla, we get the crista, which are the receptors. Then in what we know this area as the seculus and utriculus, we get another receptor known as the macula, and the macula are responsible for the position of the head relative to gravity. It will pick up that stimulus and send it to the brain. Okay, so what do we need to know about balance for examination purposes? But this slide, the contents of it would be sufficient for you to get all of the marks. So firstly, we need to know the name of the receptor, the position in the inner ear, as well as the stimulus which it picks up. So we know that in the semicircular canals, we get the receptor known as the crista, and the crista pick up the speed and direction of movement. Right, that could be two to three marks, just for saying that statement. Then the other receptor is known as the maculae, and these are found within the seculus and ut utriculus, and they pick up the position of the head relative to gravity. Right, you'll find that these words, both of the receptors, singular would be without the E, and then what the E is the plural. Being receptors, both of these do the, the same function that all other receptors do, what we spoke about, the retina being a receptor and the organ of corti, etc. All receptors receive stimuli and then convert these stimuli into impulses. And then this nerve impulse will then be carried along the auditory nerve until it reaches the cerebellum. Like to be specific, this is going to be the vestibular branch, but auditory nerve would be enough to get you the mark normally in an examination situation. Right, so the auditory nerve will take this impulse now to the cerebellum. The cerebellum is for balance. But this is different from, for example, hearing, where what hearing, you'd he the sound waves in the eventually will reach the organ of corti as pressure waves and they convert it into an impulse. The impulse goes to the cerebrum and the cerebrum can receive and interpret, understand what you heard and that could be the end of hearing. But with balance, if let's say for example, you trip and you're falling over, the receptors pick up this movement, they send it to the cerebellum, the cerebellum realizes that you're falling over. That is in balance, that once your cerebellum realizes that you're falling over. Now the cerebellum needs to respond. So what it does, it will send impulses based on, uh, on motor neurons going to the muscles of the body in order to restore balance. Maybe the muscles of the legs, and this will adjust your position, and in this way you can restore balance again. To recap, the most important things we need to know in this section, the name of the receptors, the position of the receptors within the inner ear, and the stimuli picked up. And then to say that these stimuli are converted into impulses going along the auditory nerve to the cerebellum, and then the cerebellum responding by impulses going to the motor neuro, via motor neurons to the muscles in order to restore balance. The detailed structure of the receptors is not required as per the examination guidelines. We'll just look at it in a bit more detail just so that 
we can get a better understanding of how this actually works. Okay, so we said that within the semicircular canals, there are swellings at the bases of these semicircular canals, and within that, we get the crista. Right, so the crista or crista plural, if you are stationary, not moving, we'll find that they are in the normal position. But once you move in a particular direction, you're going to find that the fluid in at least one of these semicircular canals will move as a result of your movement. And the movement of the fluid will cause this crista to bend. And when the crista bends, it's going to cause these hair cells to be stimulated, converting that stimulus into an impulse. It goes to the cerebrum. The cerebrum will pick up the, this particular crista in this semicircular canal, which is facing this direction, has moved, meaning that the body is moving in this direction. And if you move faster, obviously the fluid will move quicker and it will cause more bending. And this will be picked up as a different speed of movement. The maculae have a different structure. They've got on top of them something which is like stones or crystals. And if you are straight, these stones are now equally distributed. We're just using a, a layman's term, stones, right? Uh, they're called ortholets. But these stones, let's call them, are equally distributed when you're standing upright. When a person bends in a particular direction, the head is no longer standing straight up. Then what happens is due to gravity, these stones will now pull to one side. And when they pull on that side, this causes the macular receptor to bend and those hair cells pick up this movement, send it to the cerebellum, and the brain will understand that this person's head is not straight, it's leaning over in a particular direction. We move on to some defects with the ear. Firstly, a middle ear infection. These are caused by pathogens such as bacteria. And we know that the middle ear is connected to the back of the throat via the eustachian tube. So when a person has this infection, we can see in this diagram on the right-hand side, there's inflammation of the tissue on the outside, and there's a buildup of fluid and mucus within the middle ear. And as a result of that buildup of the fluid, it pushes against the tympanic membrane. Right? And this can cause a lot of pain. So the treatment, firstly, we can look at the cause. The cause is a bacteria. So taking antibiotics can assist in killing the pathogen and resolving this issue. However, some people have recurring middle ear infection, meaning that frequently they get middle ear infections. And in order to now assist them, they undergo a process of inserting grommets. So surgically, they'll insert these grommets, which, is in, which goes into the tympanic membrane, and it's got a hole in it. Right? It's like how where your shoelace comes through your shoe. Right? There, there's that metal part there, so very similar to that. It's a grommet here in your tympanic membrane. And this will allow for equalization of air pressure on either side of the tympanic membrane, as well as if there's extra fluid in the middle ear, it can now be released into the auditory canal. Then deafness or loss of hearing, there's different degrees of deafness, right? There's uh, different degrees of loss of hearing. Some of the causes include injury to parts of the ear. Uh, let's say, for example, a person is exposed to a very loud explosion or sound and that can cause the tympanic membrane to tear. And now that damage to the tympanic membrane will prevent it from vibrating eff effectively, and that will prevent the vibrations from, there wouldn't be vibrations to move along the ossicles, and hearing would be compromised. Even if all of the parts of the ear are fine, if the nerves that carry the impulses to the cerebrum are damaged, then automatically, the impulses don't go to the cerebrum, a person won't in receive the, the sensation of hearing and the person won't be able to hear anything in that case. Or if the part of the brain responsible for hearing is damaged, if the part of the cerebrum that is responsible for hearing gets damaged, then a person would not be able to hear correctly. Hardened wax can also be a cause of deafness. So sometimes there's excess wax that is secreted in the ear, in the auditory canal, and it gets hardened and it uh, blocks up the auditory canal and this will prevent 
sound waves from reaching the tympanic membrane or it will reduce the amount of sound waves reaching the tympanic membrane and it will reduce hearing. Also hardening of the ear tissue. If for example, those ossicles get fused together and hardened, that will prevent them from vibrating. And if they cannot vibrate, the sound waves cannot be transmitted along them as vibrations to the over window. And this will prevent pressure waves being formed in the cochlea and the organ of Corti will not be stimulated then. Right, so how can we treat it? Using hearing aids. All hearing aids have the same basic structure. They're made up of a small receiver, right? So there's basically like a microphone which will receive the sound waves. Then they've got an amplifier within it which will now increase the sound waves. And then they've got a speaker then which will send these sound waves off at a higher volume basically into the ear and this will allow a person to, to hear better right there are certain ones that are found behind the ear and there's certain ones that are inserted within the ear cochlear implants are another means of treatment for loss of hearing so sometimes hearing aids would not be able to resolve the issue. For example, if a person had damage to the ossicles and the ossicle maybe is, is no longer capable of moving or is no longer there, then the hearing aid would not be eff effective because vibrations would not be passed on into the inner ear. So with a cochlear implant, what happens is you've got a receiver on the outside, right? A sound processor here which this will receive the sound waves. It converts it to a digital code and sends it to this coil in the outside of the head. And then within the head, there's an implant and that code goes to the implant. The implant then converts this into an electrode, uh, electrical message basically, right? And this goes along this kind of a wire, which is inserted into the cochlea. And that electrical message now goes and it will stimulate the auditory nerve and it will be taken to the brain and the person will now perceive the sensation of hearing. We look at the small video uh, which will just show us how this process occurs. There are two parts of a cochlear implant. The outside part is a little computer that picks up sound and processes it. The inside part, which is implanted by a surgeon, receives the processed sound and converts it to an electrical signal that stimulates the hearing. You don't need to know all of the details of the names of the different parts, etc. You just need to know that for the issue of hearing loss, there are two possible solutions, one being a hearing aid and the second being a cochlear implant. And that brings us to the end of the section. Balance is something very important. If you lose your balance, it can be very, very painful, right? So uh, we hope you've enjoyed these recordings and you've benefited from them, hopefully. And we look forward to having possibly more recordings in the future.